Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Glazard and I'm Professor of Inclusive Education at Leeds Beckett University and I'm really delighted to um, do this presentation today um, on the role of the school curriculum in mental health. I hope you find it useful um, and hopefully it will stimulate some thinking. So I'm going to talk about the whole school approach to mental health and um, particularly focusing on the role of the school curriculum in mental health and I'm going to offer you a critique of government policy in relation to mental health. So just to start then, so it's really important that everybody understands that, that mental health um, is something that everyone experiences and it exists along a continuum which goes from being mentally healthy to being mentally ill and it can change. I like the definition um, of mental health that's offered by the World Health Organization, um, which defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual can realize his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. And the reason um, I like that definition is because this describes what a mentally healthy person is. So it is somebody who is making um, a contribution to society, is able to um, basically be productive um, and, and work productively and can cope with the normal stresses of life. Um, and the reason I choose it, I guess, is because we often, when we think about mental health, we think about mental illness. Um, and I like this definition because it actually makes us think about well, actually, you know, what does it mean to be mentally healthy, which is how I think we need to shift the conversation, really. Rather than thinking about mental illness, we need to think about being mentally healthy. We know that the causes um, of mental ill health are complex. They're multifaceted. We know that some of the causes um, reside within the individual, so that if, you know, for example, if individuals have a, have a disability, they're more likely to develop mental ill health. We know that some of the causes are rooted within the family, so children who experience parental conflict, abuse, neglect, um, children who form poor attachments with their primary caregiver, and children who experience um, trauma within the family are more likely to experience poor mental health. We know that some of the factors are rooted within the community, so we know there's a link between social deprivation and poor mental health. Um, and we also know that some of the factors are rooted within the school, within the, you know, within the exam system, um, within, within the testing culture, negative school cultures, bullying within schools and school induced trauma. Give it also children having access to a restricted curriculum um, is linked with poor mental health. So the causes are multifaceted and complex. Um, and we know that individuals from minority groups, so this could be disability, it could be race, ethnicity, it could be um, gender, sexuality. Um, we know that individuals who um, come from minority groups are more at risk um, of developing poor mental health. And Mayer's model of minority stress actually is a good model because it identifies that individuals from minority groups experience two more levels of stress um, on top of the general stresses that everybody experiences. So we all experience um, general stress within within our lives. It could be to do with unemployment, poverty, housing, relationships, finances, etc. Um, however, if you are an individual from a minority group, then you experience different levels of stress on top of on top of the general stressors. So Mayer calls these distal stressors and proximal stressors. So distal stressors are when individuals from minority groups encounter prejudice, discrimination, violence, um, and obviously that results in stress um, for those individuals. Proximal stressors are when individuals from minority groups anticipate that they will experience those distal stressors. So they're living with the constant anticipation that they will experience negative reactions, um, that they will experience bullying or prejudice, etc., discrimination. And that leads to an internalized form of stress, that living, you know, with the constant anticipation that someone will um, give them a negative reaction. So they might choose to conceal their identities, 
um, they might actually start to believe that they are um, not a worthy person. So they might take on board the stresses that are actually um, given to them. And this can create internalized psychological distress, living with the constant anticipation that you will encounter um, negativity or prejudice leads to internal psychological distress. So therefore, we need to think about children um, from these minority groups and how they might be anticipating negative reactions. So let's take LGBT children, for example. So they might be anticipating that if they come out, that they will experience negative um, reactions from parents um, or from peers or from teachers. Um, they might be anticipating um, that they will encounter prejudice or bullying um, in the corridors or in the playground or in the changing rooms. They might feel relatively safe in the classroom, but they might be then constantly anticipating what will happen next when they go in the corridor or the playground. And even though they may never encounter those things, it's the anticipation that creates um, psychological distress. So we know that some children then are more at risk than others of developing poor mental health. So individuals who identify as LGBT, um, young people who are not in um, education, employment or training, for example, um, and also looked after children as well. OK, so the mental health curriculum sits within the context of a whole school approach to mental health. So um, I'm just going to um, I'm sure you may have seen this model before, but this is the whole, this is the Public Health England um, model of the whole school approach to mental health. I'll just quickly whiz over the key aspects of this. So what this is showing is that the leadership and the management team of the school absolutely must um, champion mental health for, for anything to happen. They've got to be absolutely behind this and really pushing this at a very strategic level. So they should have policies in place. Um, they should mental health should be part of senior leadership team meetings. It should be part of governors meetings. It should be an item on, on, on the governor's agenda meetings. It should be part of the school self evaluation. It should be part of the school improvement plan. So moving around the model, the ethos and the environment um, of the school is really, really important in, in promoting um, good mental health in children and in staff, actually. So if it's a positive school culture, if children and staff experience a sense of belonging, then they're more likely to be mentally healthy. And then we need to think about what the curriculum is actually teaching children about mental health. So what are children learning about mental health? Are children being taught about mental health, what mental health is? Are they being taught about mental ill health? Are they being taught um, about how to manage their mental health? Are they being given strategies to manage their mental health? Um, are they being taught how to regulate their emotions and feelings? So there's something around emotional and social regulation. What are they being taught about resilience, for example? So how is the mental health curriculum supporting the development of mental health, mental health literacy and also well-being? We then need to think about how we work in partnership with young people. So some schools now are developing um, the role of pupil or student mental health um, ambassadors. Um, they're training children not to be peer mentors or good peer listeners so that children can actually support each other um, with mental health. We know that children often would rather speak to other children than speak to adults. Um, so um, peer, a peer mentor role can be really, really powerful, I think. Um, as long as the peer mentor is a couple of years older than the actual person they're mentoring, I think that's important. So there's some gap there. What are we training staff then? Staff need to be trained, all staff need to be trained on identifying the signs and symptoms of poor mental health. Um, and also, um, we need to think about how the school is supporting the well-being of staff as well as young people. We then need to be thinking about the interventions we provide for children. So some interventions will be um, 
universal interventions for all children, such as a mental health curriculum. Some will be group interventions. So you might identify a group of children who need like a resilience intervention, for example. Um, some might be very individual, very highly personalised um, interventions for specific children. So kind of like wave one, wave two, the old wave one, wave two, wave three um, interventions. But we also need to think about how we're identifying need within the school. Because I think a lot of mental health needs are identified in a reactionary way. So we notice that a child's got a change in their mood or a change in their behaviour. And then we suddenly, you know, think that this child may have poor mental health. But it's really important to recognise that children might not display um, visible signs of poor mental health. So they might actually be um, depressed, but might present themselves as though they're absolutely fine. They might be self-harming, but they might be covering it up so you don't know. So actually, this is about universal screening, isn't it? Actually, all children going through some kind of screening process so that we don't just rely on children who demonstrate visible signs because we can miss children um, that can go under the radar. We need to think about how we work with parents and carers as part of a whole school approach. So um, there's different levels to this, really, I guess. So one, one level is what are we doing um, about... Um, supporting parents with poor mental health you know so are we signposting parents to services within the community um, or are we running workshops with parents um, to support them with their mental health and also what are we doing with parents about sort of empowering them and helping them to manage the mental health of their child um, at home so I think that's important and then obviously we need a process of referral then for children who have whoops children who have um, complex and serious and long-standing um, poor mental health. Apologies for the slides whizzing on, very sensitive laptop. Okay, so resilience is often something which children are taught about within the curriculum. Um, and, you know, children might, as part of PSHE, they might have lessons on resilience. Um, but then resilience might also then be promoted through subject areas as well. And this is the thing with mental health is that, you know, we can teach it discreetly, we can teach it as part of PSHSE, but then we also need to think about how we can teach it through the curriculum. Okay, so, but the problem with resilience is it's often conceptualised as bounce back. So children bouncing back from difficult situations, children bouncing back from adversity. Um, this problem, the problem with bounce back is it puts the onus on the individual to actually kind of pick themselves up, dust themselves down and bounce back and get on with it. Um, but we know that resilience isn't just something within a person. It's not just innate within a person, um, it's relational. So if you have access to supportive friends or supportive family or supportive teachers or a positive school culture or a positive community, then that can enable you to be more resilient. Okay. And we know that resilience changes. So it can you can have good resilience in one context, but then poor resilience in another context. Okay. So we need to think about if we're going to encourage children to be more resilient, actually, is the school context, is the school culture, are the friendship groups um, within within the school that children have access to, are they supporting the child's resilience? Um, and is the curriculum supporting children's resilience as well? So we can't just put the onus on the child to be resilient. And Sue Roffey talks about the importance of giving children a social and emotional curriculum um, and how that can support resilience. So children need to learn about um, emotions. They need to learn about how to regulate their emotions. So they need to learn about emotional regulation. Some children need to be taught this very, very explicitly. Um, they need to develop the language of emotions. So they develop emotional literacy. They also need to develop um, social um, regulation as well so how to adapt their behavior in different social contexts okay so children may need a social and emotional curriculum and I'm just questioning really are we actually having this such great focus on resilience at the moment um, 
you know, it seems to be the buzzword in education, but is it because we're just subjecting children to a tougher curriculum and to, you know, harder exams? Um, so are we just using resilience as an excuse to, to ramp up the pressure really on children? <clears throat> Okay, so I'm just going to share some research um, that I did in Cambridge. So this was research with Cambridge United Community Trust, um, which is a community organisation charity um, that works very closely, obviously, with Cambridge United. Um, and um, what we did was we designed, um, in, in collaboration with Cambridge United Community Trust, a mental health curriculum um, that was delivered by sports coaches. It was a six week program that was rolled out to students in secondary schools um, and we targeted year eights and nines <clears throat> and they had sessions on stress, depression, um, social media, um, how to listen to others, how to be good listeners and they also learned about vulnerable groups and they learned something about resilience. We measured their mental health literacy. So um, in other words, what they, know, what they knew about mental health before the intervention um, using a mental health literacy scale survey and then after the intervention um, and it improved. We also used a well-being scale to measure their well-being before the um, intervention and after the intervention and we didn't see a significant improvement in well-being um, but we think that's because it was such a small, um, such a, a short program really but we did see an improvement in, in mental health literacy. So these are just some, some quotes from the children then. So we interviewed the students and as a result of being taught about mental health, they realised that mental health can change from one minute to the, to the next. They were able to distinguish between um, somebody who is depressed, for example, um, and someone who's got a low mood, which I think is very good for a year nine student to actually say, um, but depression is not the same thing as feeling a little bit sad. Um, when you're depressed, it can stop you doing things like you might not want to get out of bed. Um, it's not the same when you have a low mood. You might still be able to function and do things. So I think it's important that children are taught about um, things like that. Um, so one student said it's important to talk to someone about your worries. If not, this will make your thoughts and feelings worse and can lead to serious situations. So they were learning strategies to manage their mental health. So one student said listening to music and taking walks helps me. <laughs> one student said, I do not want to talk to a teacher um, because they might have to tell your parents. Um, everyone will then find out. I'd rather talk to a friend. So this highlights the importance, I guess, of peer mentoring um, approaches in school. So one of the sessions focused on stress um, and the children had to learn in this particular session about stress and the fact that not all stress is bad, that stress can actually be good because it can drive you, it can help you to achieve goals, it can push you to your limit, etc. But, but actually then when it becomes too much, then it can become negative. Um, and what they're demonstrating on here is they're demonstrating what they learned about strategies to manage stress. Okay, so there's quite a lot of stuff on here. So they're talking about exercise, physical activity, um, doing, focusing on your breathing. Okay, um, listening to music, writing a diary to write, write down your feelings. Um, the raisin technique was um, something that they all absolutely loved and it was basically teaching them to do mindful eating with a raisin. Um, so they have to look at the raisin, describe the raisin, feel the raisin, put it in their mouth, eat it slowly, describe the taste, etc. And it's kind of like doing it in slow motion, um, but it just helps them to relax as well. Listening to music, okay, meditation, having a bath. Okay, so they learn a lot about stress. They were able to identify the vulnerable groups. Um, and if you look at the quote at the, um, oh, actually, that's not come out very well. Apologies for that. But basically, they, they were beginning to realise as a result of this curriculum that actually men are more at risk because they actually don't like to talk about how they feel. Um, that, so they had lots of 
opportunity really to challenge gender stereotypes and they were actually um, talking to, to to us as a research team about the importance of you know boys and, and men actually talking about how they feel and 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 actually expressing their emotions so and they were saying well some men don't like to do that and that's silly because if they don't do that then they can just feel worse so actually it's really important that they talk about how they feel so i think it's really important through a mental health curriculum that we include those gender stereotypes um, and that we teach them about who are the vulnerable groups So one of the sessions focused on social media and um, the, the children learned about the advantages and benefits of social media, but also the negatives um, around social media. They were very, very aware of the negatives um, associated with social media. So they knew about um, body image, the pressure to look good on photographs, um, the pressure to present um, images to the world and messages to the world. Um, that you're having a wonderful time, etc., and how that can damage other people's self-esteem. They knew about bullying online. They knew about fake pictures online and, and digitally editing pictures and photographs online. They talked about the pressure of getting likes and they talked about sleep deprivation. One of the schools that I did some research in actually said that the biggest issue that they were basically facing with, with young people was sleep deprivation because they're on their phones all night, basically. But actually the children talked about the positives of social media and they said that actually, please do not take our social media away from us because we can't function without it. They thought it was important for networking, for communication, um, keeping in touch with people and for entertainment. Um, so I guess the key thing here is teaching children about the responsible use of social media and how to be good digital citizens that concept of digital citizenship is really really important but also it's important that they learn about digital resilience so actually when they do come across things that are negative online how can they respond to that situation either by talking to other people about that or by reporting something um, using the report facilities online and it's also important that children develop good digital literacy as well so that they learn how to protect their accounts um, and keep them safe, etc. So all of these things really here, I think, should be in part of a mental health curriculum. So children need to know about emotions. They need to know how to regulate emotions. They need to know about loneliness. We often think of loneliness as being um, an issue that affects older people but we know that young people experience loneliness it can be a significant issue with young people they need to know about how to get help and support and where to get help from they need to know about the risks online they need to know about particular types of mental ill health and the signs of those types and also how to manage them okay and then they need to know what things can they do to support good mental health so they can have hobbies or interests they can engage in physical activity they can have social connectivity they can do things in the community they can give back to the community all of these things will support good mental health so all of these things in no particular order i guess here um, should be i think part of a mental health curriculum and I guess we start with feelings and emotions in the early years and giving children that language around feelings and emotions and emotional regulation and social regulation. But then as we progress, we then need to start introducing children to particular forms of mental ill health and how to manage them. So some things that I think will support good mental health and, and the research also supports is a broad and a balanced and a rich curriculum. So this is ripe now for developing this in school because, you know, this is now part of the new um, Ofsted framework. So this is all about, you know, making the curriculum exciting, getting children to be um, active, getting children to engage in inquiry based learning, working in groups actually being scientists and being artists and being historians and being geographers um, and doing active first-hand experience um, learning will support their mental health. Uh, I don't know why the image hasn't shown there but 
this is all about physical activity so the role of physical activity in mental health children need access to physical activity in school and and, and good physical activity program will support their good mental health they need to see the links between um, physical well-being and mental well-being the curriculum should promote social connectivity through things like group work or paired work or um, team projects because we know that social connectivity actually promotes good mental health i think the problem is that too often children in school are working individually um, on tasks they're not working together and we know that actually these skills that they learn through group work are vital for um, functioning basically um, in, in, in the world. So they, they need to be able to work in teams. They need to be able to manage conflict and negotiate conflict. They need to be able to organize workload and plan workload. So these are all um, metacognitive skills that children need, um, but it will also promote good mental health because children are working together. Outdoor learning. So we know there's a link between um, the outdoors the environment um, and good mental health so we need to think about how we build outdoor learning through the curriculum not just for children in the early years but for children all the way through education we need to think about the role of play-based learning and active learning within the curriculum to get children excited and engaged in, in what they're learning and that will support good mental health we need to think about emotional regulation and social regulation and teaching strategies to children to help them regulate their feelings and emotions um, because they may not get that at home so they may come from backgrounds where actually parents don't demonstrate good social regulation and emotional regulation so actually we need to teach this um, to children in school how to regulate their emotions and feelings and how to adapt their behavior in different social contexts it's about reducing stigma associated with mental health. So we need to get children to talk about their mental health, to talk about how they feel. We need to tell children it's actually OK to talk about mental health. Um, we need to stop seeing mental health as a bad word. So some research suggests that primary schools are reluctant um, to use the term mental health because they're, they're worried, actually, that um, children might be too young for that term. But the problem with that is it creates stigma. So people then start to see mental health as something negative. Um, and maybe we should be using the word mental health from the, from the get-go, really, from the beginning, so that children don't see it as a negative. But the research suggests that, that primary schools prefer words like feelings um, and emotions rather than mental health. We know from the research that the attitudes of young people can be changed much more easily than the attitudes of adults. So this illustrates the need for teaching children a mental health curriculum because through that mental health curriculum, we can change their attitudes um, about mental health. So my critique really is, is that I'm going to argue that through the Green Paper, um, which was published going on nearly three years ago now, um, where the government laid out its, its commitment to mental health We've got a clinical discourse. The government is promoting a clinical um, discourse. Okay. And we've also got a crisis um, discourse as well. So, so we, we, you know, we, we are told, we, we read the news, we, we look on social media, we, we, we read the press, and we're told that numbers of um, children with poor mental health are increasing. Um, you know, it's basically getting worse. Numbers of students coming into university with poor mental health um, are increasing. And although the numbers substantiate that, it's important to recognise that actually now we are now talking about mental health. Um, we are destigmatizing mental health, so it's more out there. Uh, people feel more able to actually disclose um, poor mental health. And I think people are better now at identifying it than they were like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So we're trying to destigmatize it, obviously, but um, it's important to remember that in some cultures, um, that stigma is still very, very much there in relation to mental health. But what we've got at the moment is a therapeutic um, culture that's being implemented in schools, a culture that focuses on, on diagnosis. OK, so we have over the last few months we've seen the development of the role of the, the education and mental health practitioner 
Braille. So this emerged out of the green paper. So education and mental health practitioners are working, they're being trained up, they're going into schools, they're working alongside teachers, and they're delivering low-level clinical inter clinical interventions, um, such as low-level CBT and counselling, etc., and other therapies. Um, now, the problem with this is actually medical treatment at the level of the individual is not appropriate for the majority of children. Although I would argue that all children need a mental health curriculum, actually what most children need is they need to experience a sense of belonging, they need to experience a curriculum that's engaging, they need good self-esteem, they need an assessment system that preserves their self-esteem and doesn't damage their self-esteem, they need physical activity, they need supportive um, school cultures and supportive communities and supportive home environments. And, and all of that will actually support good mental health. Um, so some children obviously will need clinical intervention, but the vast majority don't need clinical intervention. They need good educational interventions and good pedagogy that will support their mental health. We know, however, from, from what I did at the beginning of the lecture, that the causation um, of, of poor mental health resides in often in social circumstances, so family circumstances, parental mental health, um, poor childhood experiences and negative school cultures. So the real problems are embedded within social circumstances. So therefore, the solutions to solving the mental health um, problem or crisis, in inverted commas, um, the solutions lie outside the individual. Actually, what the government should be doing is addressing the broader systemic issues which create poor mental health. So they should actually be addressing poverty. They should be addressing the issues within within families and with, with parents. Um, but actually what they've done is they've said, no, schools, you can deal with it. You can solve the, the mental health problem. Um, and these education and mental health practitioners will, will deliver interventions at the level of the individual, and then the problem is rooted within the individual. But, you know, what we're saying here, what I'm saying, is that the problem actually is outside the individual, because actually the, the poor mental health is often caused by those social circumstances in which the child is embedded. So that's where we need to do the intervention. We need to think about how we listen to children and young people and how we talk with them um, and not at them. But what we have at the moment is a medical model or a clinical model that absorbs those in power, so the government, from tackling the injustices, i.e. poverty, social deprivation, um, which create mental ill health. So actually the government have nicely shifted it and they've said to schools, you deal with it, and the problem is with the child, and it's absolved them from dealing with any um, systemic issues that actually cause poor mental health. So we actually need a systemic response, not an individual response. Okay, thank you, colleagues. I hope you found that interesting. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me um, at Leeds Beckett University. Um, so I work in the Carnegie School of Education and I'm part of the Carnegie Centre of Excellence for Mental Health in Schools. I'm very happy to collaborate with colleagues. I'm very happy to um, do joint research um, with colleagues and just to engage in, in debates um, with colleagues because actually I don't think there's one simple solution to mental health, to mental ill health. I think... There's no one magic bullet that's going to solve the problem. There's no one solution. We actually need a multidisciplinary approach. We need lots of people doing lots of things and working together, um, a collaborative approach. So I'm very, very happy to collaborate with you. Okay, thank you.